Hi everybody, Dr. Bricker here with uh, some more information for Chapter 9. A uh, reminder though, before we do that, homework 4 is due tonight. So if you have any last minute questions, you know, uh, send me an email. I'll try to, to check my email uh, tonight. And then homework 5, which is up there now, is due a week from Wednesday. So it's actually due on the 14th. And it's over uh, chapter 9. That's what we're going to be talking about today is chapter 9. Okay, so uh, this is a Wednesday. And then remember, next week is fall break, so no class on Monday or Tuesday next week. So that would be the 12th and 13th. October 12th and 13th. Okay, so next week basically marks the halfway point of the semester, so after next week. And then uh, Thursday, Group B will be doing lab. So um, Group A did the collision lab last week. This coming up week, we will have Group B in there. Okay, so just a reminder of what we did um, last week. We were talking about momentum and the impulse relationship. So impulse, it's the change in momentum. So the symbol is J for impulse. Uh, change in momentum, force times time. Uh, lots of different ways of writing the change in momentum. We have uh, final momentum minus initial momentum, uh, mv final minus mv initial. So when should you think about using the momentum uh, impulse relationship? When you have things like force, time, mass, and velocity. Now many of these problems we could still do just with kinematics and Newton's second law. It's just they take longer. So this is a, a way to make our lives uh, easier, hopefully. Okay, and then um, what happens if the outside force is zero? We've got two different kinds of problems. The first kind, let me make a little chart here. The first kind are the, are the ones where you do have force, time, mass, and velocity. And you could use the entire impulse relationship. And then we have a, another kind called collisions. So in collisions, there is no outside force. There's just an internal force between whatever is colliding. So the external force is zero. Looking at the impulse relationship up there, if the force is zero, that means uh, the final momentum minus the initial momentum should be zero. And then remember, that just means consider x and y directions separately. So the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. This is what we did in the lab, actually. So this is the second kind. Collisions or things exploding, uh, that's the second genre of problems. So straightforward uh, force, time, mass, velocity for the first sort of problems, this one here, and then the second kind are collisions. And we see both of them in this chapter. Okay, so let's uh, take a look back at the notes. We've already started Chapter 9. We'll continue it here. So in class last week, we did watch the Weird or What video. The, the uh, window washer survived a large fall and uh, the reason was a couple of reasons the first was we had a drag force on the uh, window washer but the the biggest uh, contributing factor was making the time of the collision large making the force small so uh, that's the equation that could actually save your life so remember we had um, force times time is change in momentum so regardless if you go from 0 to 60 quickly or from 0 to 60 over a longer uh, period of time, you're going to have the same change in momentum. But if you could make the time large, so make the time large, you make the average force smaller. So this is the point of airbags, crumple zones, uh, things like that, even seat belts. So in this slide, the spines of a hedgehog obviously help protect it from predators. But they also serve another function as well. If a hedgehog falls from a tree, it's not, an, it's not an uncommon occurrence. It simply rolls itself into a ball before it lands. And then its uh, thick spines cushion the blow by increasing the time. So increasing the time makes the average uh, force smaller. So indeed, hedgehogs have been observed to fall out of trees on purpose to get to the ground. Probably if I was a hedgehog, I would do the same thing. And I would use a little physics, make my time bigger by curling up into a ball, and then make the average force on myself smaller. Here's an example. We have a 0.5 kilogram hockey puck slides to the right at 10, 
meters per second. It's hit by a puck. Uh, let's see. It is hit with a hockey stick that exerts a force as shown. Okay, so the puck experiences a force as shown. So you can see from the picture it's not constant. It, it starts out slowly, goes up to 50 newtons, and then gets smaller. We want the approximate final speed. Okay, so the initial speed is 10 meters per second. And uh, we know the mass, 0.5 kilograms. Okay, great. And uh, what is the final speed? Okay, so we don't have a constant speed here, but we could approximate this shape as a triangle. So that's about looking like a triangle, right? I'm drawing right on the slide here. This time, we go from 10 to 30, so this is 20 milliseconds. So 20 to the minus third seconds, that's the amount of time. That, that would be the base of a triangle. Here's the height, 50 newtons. So the area under the force versus time graph is the change in momentum. So we're going to approximate this as a uh, triangle. So force times time, it's going to be the area under the curve. So uh, that will give us the change in momentum. So area under the curve, change in momentum. So uh, the change in momentum is the final minus the initial. So once you get the area under the curve, and I'll do it over here, it's approximately equal to one half the base, which is 20 milliseconds, times the height, which is 50 newtons. Okay, so that's the area under the curve. That's equal to the change in momentum. Okay, let's see if we can do this without a calculator. So one half times 20, that would give us 10 to the minus third, and then 10 times 50, that would be 500 to the minus third, and then 500 to the minus third would be 1, 2, 3. So 0.5 newtons. Check it with your calculator to make sure, but that's what I get. Oh, sorry, newton seconds. Okay, so that's the area of the curve equal to the change in momentum. So 0.5 newton seconds. That's mv final minus mv initial. And then the only thing that you don't know is mv final. You'll have to do a little bit of math. We'll do it here. 0.5 newton seconds plus mv initial. That would be equal to mv final. So I'm just going to divide the whole thing by m to give me v final. Okay, so you'll have to put the numbers in. But that's the way to do it. We have a force that's not constant. It actually changes over time. But we could approximate the, uh, the shape here. It's approximately a triangle, so we can get an approximate final speed. Okay, excellent. Let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, quick check 9.5. A light plastic cart and a heavy steel cart are both pushed with uh, the same force for one second, and they both start from rest. In other words, initial speed is zero for each of them. After the force is removed, the momentum of the uh, light cart, light plastic cart is greater than, equal to, less than, or you can't say if you don't know how big the force is, than the uh, heavy cart. Okay, so let's not guess. Let's actually see what we can do with this. Force times time. This is the change in momentum, which means mv final minus mv initial. And they both start from rest, so this term's actually zero. So um, maybe I should write it like this even. Final momentum minus initial momentum, and the initial momentum is zero. So really, we're comparing the final momentum of each of them. One is heavier, one is lighter, but it's the same force for the same time, so we have the same final momentum, so equal to. Now, the heavier one is going to be going slower, but they have the same amount of momentum. The lighter one will be going faster, but again, momentum is mass times velocity, so they have the same final momentum. Okay, good. So same force, same time, same impulse, which means the same change in momentum. So if you ever try to catch a water balloon, you may have learned the hard way not to catch it with your arms rigidly extended. That would be a small time and a large force. So a better way of doing it is to have a large force gently cradle the uh, water balloon to make the time of the collision larger, making the average force smaller. Okay, let's take a look at uh, solving impulse and momentum problems. So we've got a 500 uh, 
kilogram rocket sled coasting at 20, turns on its uh, engines for five seconds with a thrust of 1,000 newtons. What is the final speed? Okay, let's see what we know here. Mass, 500 kilograms. Um, its initial speed is 20 meters per second. Uh, we know the amount of time that the force acts on. Five, so five seconds and we have a thousand newtons and we want to know what's the final speed. Okay, so you could, if you wanted to, figure out the acceleration. You know the net force and the mass. You could figure out the acceleration and then from that, using kinematics, you could figure out the final speed. I mean, you could do it that way. That's perfectly good. On the test, I won't say, you know, make sure that you use impulse relationship. Do it however you want to. This way it's just going to be quicker. And again, a hint is mass, velocity, force, and time. We'll use the impulse relations, uh, relationship. Force times time, mv final, minus mv initial. And this is what we're trying to figure out, v final. So we'll do some algebra, kind of similar to the last problem. Add mv initial to both sides. When you do that, you have uh, force times time plus mv initial equal to mv final. Divide both sides by m and you have V final. Good, and you know everything. Now it's just a matter of plugging the numbers in. Right, you have force time, mass, velocity, etc. Okay? So in your calculator, make sure you do that. All right, excellent. So uh, conservation of momentum. That's the second kind of problem that we have. That's the uh, initial momentum equal to the final momentum. So the force acting on two balls during a collision form an action-reaction pair. So these are Newton uh, third law pairs, equal and opposite force. There's no external force, there's just internal forces. So if the momentum of ball one increases, the momentum of ball, do, uh, ball two decreases, but the total momentum of the system is the same. So with these problems, usually we uh, can start it like this. The initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. And then, you know, take into consideration the x direction is independent from the y direction. Okay, and then we can solve whatever we want to. Whenever you see a collision or an explosion, this is what you're going to need to use to solve these when there's no external force. Okay, so my take here, that's what I've just given you, actually. That will use this idea. The initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. And then it's up to us to fill in the details. So internal forces only act between particles uh, within a system. So the total momentum of the system um, subjected to only internal forces. In other words, there's no external force. And that will happen when we have collisions or explosions. And as you see here, the little vector sign just means this. The initial momentum in the x direction is equal to the final momentum in the x direction. The in initial momentum in the y direction is equal to the final momentum in the y direction. Just a reminder, consider x and y directions independent from each other. Okay, let's take a look at this example. Two ice skaters, Sandra and David, stand facing each other on a frictionless table. Or fric uh, sorry, <laughs> frictionless ice. Sandy has a mass of 45 and David had a mass of 80. Uh, they push off each other. After the push, Sandra moves off with a speed of 2.2, as you can see. What is David's speed? So really, this is kind of like an explosion, if you want to think about it like that. Um, in an explosion, like a firecracker, pieces go flying off in different directions. There's just internal forces between the pieces. It's the same thing here. Uh, Sandra and David push off. You can kind of get an idea with this one. David has more mass, so David is going to have uh, less speed. Now, before they pushed off, there was no momentum. They're both just uh, at rest. Afterwards, the system, the system is both of them, is going to have no momentum. So the momentum of David to the, uh, to the left, so momentum David is equal to the momentum of Sarah. And then that adds up to zero momentum of the system. So we've got uh, mass of David, velocity, or this, I should say, yeah, velocity of David, momentum of Sarah, velocity of Sarah. Okay, so I'm just looking at the magnitude. The magnitude of this is equal to the magnitude of that. 
Okay, then the only thing that we don't know is uh, the velocity of David. So the velocity of David, this is just giving me, giving me the magnitude. Mass of Sarah, velocity of Sarah, divided by the mass of David. So you can see that the, uh, when you put the numbers in, in here, this uh, David amount is less than Sarah's amount. But their total magnitude of momentum is the same. Okay, good. Jack stands at rest on a skateboard. The mass of Jack and the skateboard is 75. Ryan throws a 3 kilogram ball horizontally to the right at 4 to Jack, who catches it. What is the final speed of Jack and the skateboard? Okay, so uh, sometimes it helps to have a before picture. So before the collision is what I'm talking about. Here's the mass of the ball. Uh, velocity of the ball initially is uh, 4 meters per second. Now Jack is just standing on the skateboard over here. And uh, mass, I'll just say, of Jack. It also includes the skateboard. It's uh, 75 kilograms. That's the before picture. Now afterwards, whoops. Uh, Jack is on the skateboard, ignore that little squiggly line there, holding the ball. Okay, and uh, over here we have mass of the ball plus mass of Jack, which also again includes the skateboard. And we want to figure out their common final speed. So this is the initial situation to the left. The initial momentum it's not, uh, Jack doesn't have any initial momentum. Jack is just um, stationary. So the initial momentum of the system is the mass of the ball, velocity of the ball, initial. The final momentum, it's the final momentum of the system again. So this is uh, the total mass, so mass of ball plus mass of Jack times their final common speed. This is equal to this. So the initial momentum of the system before the collision, the, by the collision I mean Jack catching the ball, is equal to the final momentum. So you can set those equal to each other. Initial momentum equal to final momentum. We have mass of ball, velocity ball initial equal to mass of ball plus mass of Jack, and then the common final speed squiggly line there. Do a little bit of algebra to come up with the common final speed. Okay, so this is kind of like a, a sticking together type of collision, something called completely inelastic collision. So when things stick together, we can call it a completely inelastic collision. All right, let's take a look at this one. Uh, two boxes are on a frictionless table. They had been sitting at rest, but an explosion between them has pushed them apart. How fast is the two kilogram box going? This is just like uh, the Sarah problem, actually. There's no momentum before the collision, so afterwards there can be no net momentum. Each of these will have their own individual momentum, but uh, as a system, they don't have any momentum. So I'm calling that one mass one and mass two. So uh, the momentum of one is equal to the momentum of two. Whoops. I meant to call this one. Let me start over. The momentum of one, did it again. Momentum of one is equal to the momentum of two. So one is going this way. It has the same momentum of the other one this way, just in opposite directions. So the momentum of mass one is four. You can see that four times one, four units to the left. So we've got to have four units to the right for the other one. So if its mass is two, its uh, speed has got to be 2. Right? This one's got to be 2 meters per second. And then if you take 2 meters per second, multiply by 2 kilograms, you have 4 to the right. That's got to be equal to 4 meters per second times 1 going to the left. They add up to 0 because they're in opposite directions. Okay, very good. Uh, let's see what we have here. A 1 kilogram blocks a, uh, box is sliding along frictionless surface it collides and sticks to um, the two kilogram box. Afterwards, the speed of the two boxes is. Same thing, the initial momentum is just in this picture. So the initial momentum of the system 
is equal to 3 kilogram meters per second, right? The 2 kilograms not moving. And then afterwards, they're stuck together. The total mass here is 3 kilograms. So how fast do these have to go? Well, the mass is 3, so uh, we have to have this add up to 3 kilogram meters per second. So this one's going to have to move at 1 meters per second. And then it's the same momentum. The initial momentum of the system, 3 kilogram meters per second. The final momentum of the system, that's what this represents, is also 3. So it has to move at 1. Okay? So when the mass is 1, you're going at 3. When the mass is 3, you're going at 1. It's the same amount of momentum. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Okay, here we have a 30-gram uh, ball, so be careful, that's in grams, fired from a 1.2-kilogram spring-loaded toy rifle with a speed of 15. What is the recoil speed of the rifle? So again, this is the same thing that we've been doing. This is um, the uh, bullet goes to the right. The uh, rifle is going to have to recoil to the left. So the momentum to the right of the bullet it's going to call it bullet, has to be equal to the momentum of the rifle back to the left. And then it's really the exact same problem. So you know uh, the bullet is leaving with 15. You know the mass of the bullet, 0.3. So the momentum to the right would be, sorry, 0.03. It would be 0.03 times 15. That's going to the right. That would have to be equal to the mass of the rifle times whatever the rifle speed is back to the left. So it's really the, the same problem. So looking at these little arrows, I can then write it like this. Mass of rifle, uh, speed of rifle, and again, this is just the magnitude I'm looking at, the way I'm doing it here. Mass of the bullet times velocity of the bullet. Then the only thing that you don't know is the velocity of the rifle. So mass of bullet, velocity of bullet, divided by massive rifle. So they have the same amount of momentum. The bullet has a lot less mass, so it goes faster. The rifle has got a lot more mass, so it goes slower. But the total momentum is the same. So this is similar to uh, 9.25 on homework 5. And we'll take a look at this when we meet on Wednesday. And then we'll do problem 9.19 on Wednesday as well. So inelastic collisions just uh, it's physics talk for sticks together. So two objects stick together. In the lab that we did with collisions, we that was the first type that we actually did. Okay, so several different examples. You can take a look through through these examples. So perfectly inelastic is physics talk for sticks together. Okay, let's take a look at this one. Uh, in a, assembling a train from several rail cars, two of the cars with masses two and 2 times 10 to the 4th and 4 times 10 to the 4th are rolled towards each other. When they meet, they couple and stick together. The lighter uh, car has an initial speed of 1.5 meters per second. Okay, you can see that in the picture too. And then uh, the collision causes it to reverse direction at 0.25. And you can see that for the after picture. Okay, what is the initial speed of the heavier car? So think about it. You have a lighter one going to the right, a heavier one going to the left in the initial picture. They uh, clock to get, they click together, and then afterwards they're heading to the left. So the net momentum afterwards is to the left, right? This the momentum of the system to the left is to the left here. A common mass times the speed. That's the momentum after the collision. It has to be equal to the same momentum before the collision. So the momentum of this car here has to be greater than the momentum of car one. Because the net momentum is to the left, the net momentum before the collision also has to be to the left. Although this one has some momentum to the right, um, this one must have more momentum to the left because after the collision, the momentum is to the left. Okay? Same thing though, it's a collision. We can set it up like this. The initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. Now you have to be careful with, with, with your signs here. It's a vector, so that's, uh, that's going to the left. Now the final momentum would be their combined mass, so mass 1 plus mass 2 times, I'm just going to call it V final. OK, 
Okay, so that's the momentum afterwards. Now the initial momentum would be mass 1, V1 initial, plus mass 2, V2 initial. And then the only thing that you don't know is what you're looking for, V2 initial. This is what you don't know. You know everything else here. Just be careful. Make sure that you put the uh, negative sign in there. So I'm running out of room uh, to solve this, but now it's just an algebra problem. You know everything except for V2 initial. Now, V2 initial should come out to be negative. So when you do this whole thing, you'll see that it does come out negative. Okay, and then we will look at these other problems when we have class. And then um, we'll save two-dimensional collisions for class as well. It's the same thing that we've been doing. We just have to look at it in um, X direction independent from Y direction. Something like this. This looks really complicated, right? This is just if you have a whole bunch of particles here. A whole bunch of particles are, you know, in this uh, example, um, billiard balls. Okay, so it just takes a little bit more time. Really twice as long, right? Because you've got two different directions. And we'll take a look at that on Wednesday as well. So Wednesday we'll do some problems with momentum finish up this chapter and we'll probably hopefully get to the point where we start talking about chapter 10 which is the energy chapter. Okay any uh, questions just email me and I'll talk to you soon.